Hey there, welcome to this episode of the Aurelius Podcast. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder and CEO here at Aurelius. Our special guest this time is Lou Rosenfeld, founder of Rosenfeld Media, the publisher of many really great UX and design books. Lou is also author of Information Architecture for the World Wide Web, the seminal book about IA that really laid much of the groundwork for how we make, find, and search information in our digital world. Lou has been around our industry for a long time, and he shares with us some very timeless advice about being a practitioner in UX and design. He also shares some really fun stories about way back when this thing we call the internet was just getting started. Also, where IA came from for him and what led him to create a publishing company as well as two major UX conferences. I think you'll find our chat pretty interesting. Finally, Lou and I got into the topic of growing design and what's on the horizon to further push companies to be truly customer and research driven. He very kindly mentioned our own product here at Aurelius and how he sees it helping companies break down the silos of information from user research and customer feedback. For those of you listening that are trying to do just that, I'd invite you to check out what we're doing. We offer a 14-day free trial with no restrictions for you to check us out. Just head over to our website, AureliusLab.com. That is A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. The last thing I want to mention is that we've been getting very positive feedback and response from the community about our podcast, and for that, we are very grateful. If you enjoy what we're doing here with the Aurelius podcast, it would mean so much to us for you to leave a review on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to the show. We produce the podcast entirely for free with no ads to give you the best listening experience possible. And those shares and reviews really do help others find the show. Okay, here we go with Lou Rosenfeld. Welcome to Aurelius Podcast, episode 21 with Lou Rosenfeld. He is the founder of Rosenfeld Media and co-author of the Polar Bear book, which for those of you not in the know is about information architecture. Lou, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. It is our pleasure. We're very excited to chat with you. You uh, have been in the industry for quite some time. I would consider one of the OGs of, uh, of our industry. and, and Not an OF. Not an OF, yeah. Well, you know, whichever one you prefer, I, I like to say OG. Uh, let's, long keep it, uh, let's keep it PG. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Longtime contributor of all things UX, all things IA, and uh, still going very strong in my opinion. So we're, we're glad to, to chat with you and, and uh, learn a little bit more about some of those things. Awesome. Where should we start? Well... You know, I think for those of us listening to this episode, it would be really interesting to kind of hear how you got into this world, right? And where you started all the way back from even, say, prior to the Polar Bear book um, up to where you are now, maybe the Reader's Digest version. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. Um, otherwise, uh, I could go on a bit long. But, uh, you know, getting into this world uh, um, in 1988 or what what not is not was not really the same world. It wasn't really in existence, uh, and that was kind of the beauty of being involved in in tech at that time was we were inventing worlds that we did we did without even realizing it. And um, uh, you know my in a the Reader's Digest version of my path was um, I graduated with a history degree from the University of Michigan in 1987, and. Um, I think we immediately had a recession and I really didn't know what to do. Wanted to go to grad school because that seemed safe. Um, the real world wasn't really uh, cutting it for me. And uh, I I wanted to go to library school, hmm. uh, which was kind of surprising to people who knew me uh, because they didn't think I was that organized and <laughs> they didn't see me as a librarian. And I didn't really see me as a librarian either. Uh, but um, uh, it just seemed interesting to organize stuff and at least information stuff. And, um, uh, I, I figured I might learn about database management and that would be pretty cool. And I could do that without having to get a computer science degree or getting a, a business degree, neither of which I really wanted to do. So it seemed like a safe middle ground, hang out with the librarians for a couple of years. If, if the job didn't work out, I could always fall back to being a reference librarian. But you know, once I got there, um, 
the, to uh, the University of Michigan's uh, School of Information. It had just been renamed. It's since been, re been renamed in high school. But when I got there, all the faculty were, were talking big talk about the impending information revolution. And again, this is like 1988, 89. And that was really exciting. And we all drank the, the Kool-Aid, so to speak. But um, it was not so obvious what that was going to mean practically and what kind of careers we were going to have and how we would take librarianship and port it to this new information age uh, and get it out of the libraries. Mm -hmm. So a lot of library schools at that time were focused on libraries and not librarianship. And I was really interested in taking librarianship into new settings and mm -hmm. especially into digital settings. And there was a, a interesting cadre of people that were starting to do that in, in the library world. Uh, and things were digitizing and, and just to by just to give you a little bit of context, um, when, you know, you, you know, people um, were doing things online in those days, uh, but it was a very different kind of online in 1988. So can you imagine um, online meant this? Databases of research, uh, like Dialog and and LexisNexis and, and services like that were, were huge companies, huge industries at that point. And they would charge you upwards of sometimes $300 an hour to use them in 1988 dollars. And you were going in at uh, 2400 baud. And I remember using acoustic couplers on an old style telephone uh, back then in 88 in, in grad school. Hmm. And because you were going online and it was so expensive, our professor scared the living daylights out of us and said, you're not going to waste money. I'm going to fail you if you make mistakes. And I remember we had to like come up with search queries in advance, you know, search query plan A, plan B, plan C. And, uh, um, uh, you know, so you were ready if your, your first search didn't get the right results. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll still remember, uh, I still remember people, uh, getting ready for their turn and their hands were shaking. It was just, Jeez. that was what, that was what the, the sort of predecessor of the internet was back in 88. But like really quickly, we started seeing all these tools like, uh, I'm, I'm not giving you the Reader's Digest version, by the way, so you can <laughs> pick it up, but I'll, I'll just, just make a quick point. The tools back then were really shitty. Mm -hmm. We're talking about FTP, mm -hmm. Telnet, uh, you, do you even, do you, as I, I, you know, I do even remember these, you're sure. you not heard of them, but sure, sure. Archie, Veronica, uh, ways and, um, and then gopher, which came out of your hometown there in Minneapolis the university, the university of Minnesota created something called gopher. And those were like the first distributed information sites, but mm -hmm. instead of, uh, the web, it was like not hypertext, but it was hierarchy. So you can move through menus, and sometimes the menus would take you to a, a Gopher server and another computer somewhere. Hmm. And that was kind of what what was going on. And and so just to kind of bring it back, um, I was one of those people who was really interested in those tools and trying to make them more useful and easier to understand. And so I started a little company um, with one of the faculty at Michigan teaching people how to use the internet like in 1991. And this is before the web. This is just as Gopher was getting going and how to do all these horrible things like email as well as FTP and Telnet and such. And, you know, we, this is like a hobby company and we called it Argus Associates. And um, we started teaching classes and we got really kind of tired of doing that. Uh, because it was just so hard and we got out of it right before the web hit and made it easy. Mm -hmm. We could have actually, you know, had a pretty decent sized business if we would have stayed with that. Instead, what we started doing was teaching people not how, mu how so much to use the information, but how to make the information. And around that time, we started teaching students at Michigan. I became, became a doctoral student around then, uh, how to create content on certain topics. For use for uh, on the internet, so um, 
Our students did things like creating the guide to personal finance resources on the internet or theater resources on the internet or statistics resources on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I put them together in uh, one gopher server initially, and then later a web server. And that was uh, a clearinghouse of these guides, these topical guides. And, uh, and so that was really exciting because when we were teaching, uh, students had to do this. They, they were, went crazy. They, they loved it. And some of them, like a year or two later, were working in Silicon Valley as VPs at places like Excite based on the experience they had in this one little class. Meanwhile, um, I was, just, you know, I was having a good time, but, um, that little library that we set up, I remember getting an email from a guy who was complaining to me. He was saying, you know what, what you're doing is, is competing with what we're doing, the World Wide Web Virtual Library. And I said, well, we've been doing it first. And it turns out that guy was named Tim Berners-Lee. <laughs> Nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows who he is. Yes, I've been admonished by Tim Berners-Lee. That's going to be, you know, one of my, I'll go on my gravestone. Maybe. I'll get you uh, a trophy. Oh, man. Yeah, I've been admonished <laughs> by him. Uh, I met Larry Page when he was still a grad student there at Michigan. I wish I became his friend, um, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Vince Cerf was, flew, flew, flew through there at one point. Anyway, so um, I, I, like, we started showing people how to build content. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the first classes ever taught at the university level uh, uh, that, was, that were teaching people how to create information for the internet. And... Uh, Argus turned into a company that was teaching clients how to do that and helping clients do that. And so um, I had to choose between this growing company that uh, Peter Morville came on board and became my partner. And, you know, we saw a lot of opportunity or staying in the doctoral program. And for about a month, I was going to walk away from the company. And then I, I got smart and decided I could always go back for my PhD. And uh, so we built Argus to about a 40 person agency in Ann Arbor, Michigan that just did information architecture uh, when nobody had heard of information architecture. And we did really well, it was a great company until we hit the economic downturn of 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. We went from peak to, to shuttered in six months. Now we were like the canary in the coal mine for that economy at that time. Uh, I became a solo consultant. I worked with a lot of um, large corporations that had information problems and I became kind of a, a corporate information therapist started working and doing a lot of enterprise IA consulting um, and uh, in that era in the two, 2000s uh, helped start the information architecture conference which uh, the information architecture summit I should say it's just been renamed the conference but that's been going for around 20 years started the uh, information architecture Institute um, Got involved with user experience design, helped get the user experience network started, um, and um, felt like, you know what, UX is really interesting because we need more perspectives pointed at these complex things we're creating, namely websites. And um, felt like there weren't enough books. Mm -hmm. in there, I'd written a book with Peter and information architecture for the World Wide Web, and that did very well. And I felt like there was more. Uh, need for books like that, and uh, I decided to start a publishing company to do that, and that's what Rosenfeld Media is. And since then, we've expanded and started doing conferences too. We, we do a couple of virtual conferences a year, plus Enterprise UX, plus the Design Ops Summit, and we have a corporate training wing as well. And uh, so that's kind of what I've been up to. I, I start a lot of things. I'm not always so good at seeing them through, but I try, and uh, often other people help me. And uh, that's probably more than the Reader's Digest version. So my apologies to the listeners who are still listening. Thank you. <laughs> who are still listening. Well, it's an, it's an interesting journey from way back in the days of where you tried to find a list of stuff to surf the internet. That was, I mean, that was it. And you mentioned that, right? And you helped build some of those lists where now that would be largely ignored because information is so quote unquote cheap, right? Yeah. It's so It's so accessible. It's so available and to to kind of hear how you know i don't know if it was a slow or quick pivot for you to to say well it's no longer for me about creating that information or content uh, i want to help other people understand how to create uh that information or content right well i like to help other people plus i get bored quickly i'm kind of a dilettante and uh um 
I like to learn something when no one else is really paying much attention to it. And then as soon as they start take, taking note, I get out of it and it gets boring for me and I move on to something else. But I think that's true of a lot of people in my generation mm-hmm. who've been involved because uh, I think a lot of us are natural gap fillers. Mm-hmm. Like, so I'm going to, let me, ch- let me test this idea out on you, Zach. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. So I have to give a talk, a new talk in a couple of weeks in, in Taipei and, and uh, it's, it's concerning me. Uh, and it's kind of about the birth of IA and, and, and its path. Um, so, uh, you know how there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, Venn diagrams. Too many. Know, there's too many, right? Yeah. And I, I think there's a problem with how we understand Venns because, um, we, we're, we don't, first of all, pay enough attention to the intersection. Mm-hmm. We're always like the three things. What are those three things that come together? We, we think a lot about the three things and we don't like, it's the thing in the middle that's so interesting. But if you look at a Venn diagram, there's often no label for that middle. So for me, it was always like content, context, and uh, users coming together for IA in the middle. That was the kind of central concept. But you see a lot of Venns where there's no kind of like definition of what it is those things have come together to create. And then on top of that, I think when you look at a Venn diagram, you're seeing a state, an endpoint, and you're not seeing the progress to get to that endpoint. In other words, those circles have moved. Mm-hmm. They've come together, but they were not together. Mm-hmm. Really, instead of intersection, we're really looking at convergence. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a lot of us were in one of those circles and were uncomfortable. We felt kind of like, I don't know, confined in our kind of home circle. And so we started venturing away and kind of pulling each circle toward other circles. So like I was kind of on the content side as a librarian, and I kind of pulled toward the usability engineers, pulled toward that user circle, and then learned a lot about the business side, the business context, and sort of started pulling in that direction, while people in those circles pulled in our direction. Mm-hmm. So there's this kind of motion that the Venn doesn't really show, but that's really the important thing. And, how, and that middle where we all come to is a gap. And a lot of us are gap finders. Like, I'll bet you a lot of people listening have been in this situation. Maybe you were in grad school or college or somewhere where you were thrown into a group to do a project. And you didn't know how to do a project as a group. And everyone was just sort of stumbling around. And after a little while, you just kind of rolled your eyes and said, ah, oh, screw it. I'm going to be the manager, I guess they call it a project manager. Mm-hmm. You may not be a very good project manager, but at least you're willing to do it. I bet there's a lot of people who kind of roll their eyes and say, I'll do that, I guess. I'll do project management or, oh, I'll do IA or, oh, I'll do whatever it is that no one else wants to do. So that's the gap. And you are pulling those circles together when you mm-hmm. do that. So a lot of people who are in my generation didn't like go to school for UX or IA or anything like that you can now. And so we had to kind of pull our, our, our way in those different directions away from traditional practices, away from traditional disciplines, get out of those circles, basically. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought and concept there too. I, I think that that's true. And if I may even add something to that, what's Please. curious is I, is I feel like what we're seeing now in our industry is almost complete overlap. There almost there almost is no more Venn diagram, right? Like everybody they just see UX and UX is everything, which to me then means UX is nothing, right? UX is just it's all of design, it's all of anything you're creating for web or digital, which then in some respects means well we don't have to, you know, pay proper attention to things specifically like research or things specifically like organizing information or taxonomy right or understanding language and how people find things i'm curious to hear your reaction to that because uh another another i guess point that you also brought up is these gap fillers i've also then seen some of a flip where a lot of folks coming out of school now say you know i just really want to get into a place and i want to do the strategy but how could you know (laughs) how can you know what proper strategy is without having understood all the parts that make up a strategy that's the that's the, that's the piece missing for me. 
And at this point, I realize I'm monologuing a bit where we sound maybe like a couple of old guys complaining about stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, first of all, it may seem like there's there's a complete intersection or complete convergence of whatever circles are are being uh, discussed at any moment. But let's take a little, you know, um, a little page out of the the book Flatland and turn the that Venn diagram on its side. Mm Look at it from the side, and you're, you'll see a T-shape. So you know the concept of the T-shaped person. Yeah, I do. It was an ideal I, concept originally. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I think that's really what's still going on. I mean, like a lot of us like, have that sort of breadth but shallowness, and we still have that depth in one or two places. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I think that shallowness is—it sounds bad, but it's actually good if you have that exposure. And you can at least communicate with other people, whether you're a designer trying to communicate with a developer, a developer with a marketer, whatever it might be. I think a lot of the problems that we face is that we don't have a shared vocabulary. We don't speak each other's language. If we can at least get that far, um, I think we can actually do great work together. And so I really, like, I'm starting to see the lines blur in a good way. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of, Younger people, especially, are are not like all wrapped up in disciplinary uh, or tribal uh, garb. You know, like they they don't care what you call it. They don't care what tools you use. They don't care what methodology you use. They just want to solve problems using whatever's out there. Mm-hmm. I think of Luke Kabluski is like the first person I met who was like that. One of our authors, mm-hmm. and uh, um. He just, like when he wrote web form design for us, it was just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk to graphic designers. I'm going to run a usability study. I'm, I'm going to learn about you know, forms design from the traditional perspective. Uh, it was just like such a nice synthesis of, of different things without really, like, he didn't ask permission to, yeah. like, from one discipline to the other. It was just a natural thing for him. Yeah. I think more and more people are like that, and that's exciting. Yeah, no, I, and I love that. I couldn't agree more that that, that that T-shaped model and even, you know, maybe another term, generalist, right? Uh, generalists, I think, are very, very good things, particularly in the world that we live in now. Um, I think that they can be very effective. In fact, m- maybe supporting your point even further, I think that a lot of companies still have this idea or this hang-up, uh, and, and not rightly so, that all those traditional garbs that you mentioned still have to exist for things to happen successfully. And, and we all know that that's actually not true yet. We still go through the motions because it's almost tradition or it's expectation. Right. And, um, the way I've said this to some folks is it doesn't really matter what you call me or yourself or anybody else. You know, we have a certain problem to solve. We have a certain goal to achieve. If, if we can simply be better at rallying around that in absolute clarity, or as absolute as we can get. You know, if you had, if you tend to be a little bit stronger on the technology side, and I tend to be stronger on the design side, and somebody else tends to be stronger on the organization and management side, great. But we're all still solving that same problem, and we can all weave in and out of those roles as we see fit. Um, but the actual lines, as you say, can and should be blurred. It's it's almost irrelevant. We're all we all take responsibility for achieving this this outcome. Well, and we that in, in a way we're all good at. Uh, we're all potential gap finders then. You're on that team. It might be a great team, but there's still some gap. It may be a gap just for today's meeting. It's amazing how people will um, kind of identify and, and comfortably step up to the plate mm-hmm. when there's a, a, a shortage uh, or a shortfall of a particular talent on the team. Um, I, you know, I also wanted to say, like, you know, I gave you a little your listeners probably a lot more history than they they wanted but i do it partly to, to, just to kind of have people who may be more recent entries into the field understand a little bit about what it's like to have started out 25 years ago or, or even more recently when you know we didn't have this sort of ability we were really given permission to jump from discipline to discipline i mean like if you went let's say to library school like i did you wouldn't like take classes in another department and then you wouldn't go to other conferences necessarily besides the library and information science ones Mm -hmm. you wouldn't use different methods or tools you 
you really, uh, I mean, you would, you would just, and you wouldn't read different journals. You were kind of just very siloed in your own little pocket of, of expertise. You stayed in your lane. You stayed in your lane and, and it was just kind of considered strange to go outside. Now I'm sure other fields were a little different and maybe a little more open-minded in that regard, less, less insecure because we have a, we had a profound insecurity in my particular field. Um, but I, I think, you know, that's like this thing we're still a little uncomfortable with and, and there's still a little tribal residue from time to time with, with people in my generation. And, and don't hold that against us. We're, we're working on it. We're much better off than we were <laughs> 10 years ago, even. Awesome. You know, I'm curious. Uh, this is something I wanted to ask you even after hearing uh, some of your history and things like that, right? So you've been around, you've seen a lot of different problems. You've seen a lot of different solutions. You've seen a lot of different ways people went about that. Is there one or even less than a handful of things that you know across all of that experience just canonically help make more successful designs, products, features, strategy in the work we do? Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about like the, the Steve Jobs impresario genius approach to figuring stuff out coming up with ideas, designing stuff, um, versus the more realistic fact that, you know, you have to have an organization that's doing this stuff. It, it, you know, is that just, you know, everyone wants to be Steve Jobs, but, you know, there's just only one Steve Jobs or, you know, or Elon Musk or whomever you want to choose. It just, just, that's just rare and you can't really count on that. And you really do have to see broader teams or, or even more broadly full organizations bringing, you know, con conceiving and, and uh, creating and bringing to market products and services. And for that reason, uh, I'm really interested in what, you know, companies like Aurelius is doing, because I think if you're going to have all the, all, if you, if you have an organization that's designed to, to, um, to create products and services and bring them to market, you need to have a, a really robust, wide range of evidence for the people in, inside that organization to draw on. And, you know, this is something I've been speaking about for a lo many years, and I really don't see enough examples still, but we're getting there, it's getting better. And that is taking all the research, we call it user research, market research, analytics, voice of the customer research, uh, big data work, and putting it together in one big um, brain, if you will. Now, right now, that stuff tends to be siloed. So you have these organizations that are just spending through the nose to, to create evidence of one type or another, but they are doing it in silos. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to see, finally, um, organizations starting to break beyond that. And I think tools like yours are, are going to be really helpful there. And I think also kind of people that we have now that are better at synthesis and at learning each other's languages and are more comfortable getting out of their disciplinary silos, that you can put them together with this robust, rich, but varied bunch of types of research that we're producing and put that stuff together in ways that has not been put together in before. That, to me, is what's really, really, really exciting right now. And so, like, I see what you guys are doing and I see tools for managing research coming out of many other areas, uh, market research agencies, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of vendors that are trying to do similar things, but from very different perspectives, because they're all seeing the same problem. Mm -hmm. and, you know, over time, a category is going to emerge and there are going to be a few, you know, really good tools in that category to help put things together. And uh, when you put those things together, you're not only like commingling your data, you're also, by extension, commingling your people in ways yes. that the organizational silos aren't supportive of right now. Yes. Yes. And that's exciting. So like with MailChimp, uh, when Aaron Walter and, and Greg Bernstein were, were working there, they were doing some really interesting things with the most kind of simple tool. Um, uh, they were using Evernote and dumping all kinds of research into Evernote. And like, you know, a researcher might have... Um, uh, um, 
like stored their stuff there and went back six months later to find something they had created and in the process found other research data that a different researcher from another business unit had created. And it's like, who's that? Yeah. They know, are they trying to solve the same thing I am or can they help me solve what I'm solving? Can we solve it together? Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. I love it. I, well, I mean, let me just say, first of all, we're, we're pretty honored that you would even mention us um, as exciting in that field. Thank you. It really does mean a lot to Joseph and I, but, but further to that point, I'm really glad that you brought this up because something that's very important to Joseph and I, and this has become, uh, I hesitate to say hot button issue, but something that we're really passionate about recently is that point where you talk about commingling people, right? So I, uh, we recently rela- released a, a, a different subtrack of our podcast called Inside Aurelius, right? And so jo- it's just Joseph and I talking about things that are important to us, you know, how we're building Aurelius, the product the company, what, it, what does it mean? What are we, what are we focused on? And this, and this idea of getting developers and technologists to care, have a stake in, and be involved with research, understanding of the customer, I think is so critical towards that movement that you're referring to. Because it is, for me, uh, and if I, if I may steal your words, such, a, such an important factor in that commingling of people, right? And we talked about this in that episode because... Even when we used to work together prior to Aurelius, uh, back when we were at the nerdery, this is just simply what we did. Joseph was part of the research when we did stuff because mm-hmm. the perspective he has or any technologist, uh, developer, engineer has on the data and the understanding of the customer we have lends a perspective uh, or a lens, if you will, uh, that would otherwise not exist. And that, on- that actually adds new knowledge. And it, and it furthers what we're able to do. I'm curious if you've seen, because, you know, particularly with what you're doing with Enterprise UX, uh, Design Ops Summit, right? You're having a lot of these conversations where people are trying to solve this problem. I, I'm very, very curious if you have any stories to share about this idea of that commingling of people, maybe in this case, even de- uh, developers and engineers. I don't know that I can really pull one great story. I mean, I, I think this story is generational. As I said before, I feel like the the people who are kind of entering the field now are, are tend to maybe um, kind of gap. I don't know if they're gap finders in the same way, but they're synthesists for sure, and um, they they just have a certain comfort level uh, solving problems with people who are not like them. So I, I wish I had a really good case study to to throw out. Um, I just I think I think it's too early in a way. Mm-hmm really to really get at the the um the, the sort of holy grail examples because i, I feel like it, we're right now at the point of consciousness raising mm-hmm. uh, and uh you know there's probably a few really enlightened organizations that um that do this i mean like you know i keep finding better and better I, let me put it here this way i keep finding things that give me hope so when i mentioned earlier that we do a bunch of virtual conferences a year and on um uh, it's, it's going to be July 10th or 11th. We're going to do a, a one-day virtual conference on, um, I think we're calling it something like uh, like uh, it, the measuring the impact of design. Mm-hmm. I don't know measuring or valuing the impact of design or making the case for design. Sure. It's, it's still being developed. And I really wanted to find um, someone who is a CEO of a recognized company who did not come from a design background and who could speak to the value of design. Mm-hmm. In other words, someone who had his you know, Saul on the road to Tarsus or Damascus, but well, yeah, he was on his road to Damascus, had one of those moments of realization that, wow, there's this thing called design and it's really important. And uh, I'm now a believer. Uh, I wanted to get a CEO who'd been through that because I really wanted to have our, I want to have our attendees hear that perspective. And I thought it'd be really hard to find someone. Sure. And I found someone really fast. Really? A guy named Dheeraj Pandey. Okay. Who is the founder and CEO of Nutanix, okay. which is, I'm not sure if they're public or they're going to go public or they're, they're, you know, a sizable company that does some really interesting cloud-based work and they're completely design driven and he's uh, like a 
engineer who dropped out of a PhD program just like me. So I like him. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, he is, he's going to be our opener. And Wonderful. Really, and it's not just that he, you know, it was not super hard to find him, but that he was excited to talk to designers. Yeah. Tell that story. That to me is really hopeful. That is Think about awesome. trying to find someone like that five or 10 years ago. Good bloody luck. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's wonderful. I mean, that, and that, I, that is extremely exciting. Someone at that level who, who is running the organization, I mean, eating the dog food, not just saying we should be design led. He's, it sounds like he's a convert in this case, right? Like uh, allowing understanding of customers and making smart decisions based on what we know of them to not only inform what happens in the business, but then what things we build to meet the needs of both the business and customers. Absolutely. It, you know, so I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of moments any given week where I hear something that is a really hopeful anecdote like that. And to me, it's like the, the fact that those little things, I hear them or I experience them more frequently than I might have a few years ago. And, and that's kind of the change I've been looking to see. I don't, I don't really have the, the one big fantastic example yet. I'm sure we'll get there. But um, I have a lot of hope and optimism about where things are going. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I mean, it's interesting too. I want to go back to one thing you said in that, in that response early on is that we're sort of at this point of awareness right now. And that's interesting to me because, you know, I mean, we work in the space. We're trying to, we're trying to build a product and service that helps people that. And it's interesting to me because I agree. And the reason that I agree is that I, what I'm finding and perhaps what you're finding with, you know, design ops and even in enterprises is that what folks are trying to do is just simply extend their reach of what's happening in design and the information they are gathering. And that to me is, feels like it's what's becoming sort of step one, right? Because you said it yourself is that there's been people, uh, there's been people trying to understand customers and their behavior and their needs for tens of years now, easily, but perhaps they're doing it in silos. And so all of a sudden I, I get tapped on the shoulder by Lou and he says, do you know anything about this? And I said, well, yeah, I've been trying to solve that same problem. I've got a litany of research that I can share with you. And then all of a sudden <laughs> you, know, you turn around and go, I had no idea you were trying to learn about that. And so, yes, it's that awareness of just um, a convergence. This is, this is taking it back even further in the conversation, a convergence of fields, right? So, cause mm -hmm. what's also happening, um, if I may go on a tangent for a minute, what, what we find very interesting with Aurelius, right? Is absolutely researchers, designers, product people, they like what we're doing. That's the obvious answer. Those, that's the obvious market, right? Second to that are marketers. And then people like product marketers and then people like success teams in customer success management, right? Why? It's because they're all working with the same information. They're all trying to cultivate the same insight. They're just trying to act on it perhaps in different ways. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned marketers because uh, that makes me think of user testing. Mm -hmm. And um, I know those, go those guys a bit and uh, great people, great company. And um, my understanding of their story is they started out kind of uh, doing more HCI style user research. And that was the initial audience that they were trying to serve. And they found pretty quickly that there's actually a much bigger audience uh, among marketers. And, Interesting. and that's, I think, become their primary audience. Um, but, you know, I mean, just this idea of, of different kinds of people working on, on the same problems together. You know, I, I, there's not a talk or an interview uh, I'm involved in these days, even when I'm interviewing people, uh, where the metaphor or the fable of the blind man and the elephant doesn't mm. come up. And uh, I, I'm going to repeat it because, you know, I'm surprised at how few people actually are familiar with it. Yeah. Blind men are out for a walk in the jungle and i don't know i don't get that you know because like there's no no sighted person guiding them they're just like happen to be walking through a jungle together just take it through a stroll no idea what's out there I, you know but there they are and um they come across an elephant and uh, one of them feels the trunk and says i, I found us a snake and another one says uh, is feeling a, a, the leg and says no 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 that's not a snake it's a tree uh and, and so on and so forth and until they talk together share data um, until they do that, have a conversation. 
they can't achieve the true insight of understanding that they've encountered an elephant. And um, I don't. I think that you know that metaphor is so true today that we have. It's not just in our field; it's in all kinds of fields that we have such complexity uh, in the challenges we face. Our little brains just can't handle it. <laughs> we can't. You really kind of. I mean, even Steve Jobs would he be so successful uh, working in this industry today? I don't know. I mean, it's more complicated now than it was in 1975. And you know, so. You have to solve things as an organization, and organizations have a really hard time with that. And I think we're all working on doing one way or another is, is you know, especially designers, is we're trying to help organizations solve big problems together. That's what it comes down to. And that's why so many people start off in craft in our field, but end up finding that it's not the craft that's the critical thing, it's the ability to do the soft skills stuff, the conversations, the listening, the negotiating, the leading, the managing facilitating that's the stuff interviewing that's i mean those are the things that really really help you work with other people and figure out that there's an elephant in, in front of you yeah absolutely i couldn't agree more and in fact you know i've mentioned this in a couple uh recent episodes we've done with guests because of a talk i've been giving recently uh how to sell your ideas to anyone Right, and it's uh, admittedly a bit of a misleading title because I start off by saying you're not going to sell anything to anyone who isn't already willing to buy. So if we can get that out of the way, what you're really doing in selling, uh, selling your design ideas, your feature recommendations, right, or your or your product changes, is what you're doing is you're convincing somebody that it's good for the product, for the customers, and the company. In that statement, we need to unpack some assumptions. We, the assumptions are, you know who the customers are. You know what's good for the company. You know what's right for the product, right? And interestingly enough, successful selling of ideas, I'm using air quotes, is really, again, this topic of convergence in our conversation. It's a convergence of that understanding and then how you relate what it is that you do as a UX designer, as a product leader, as a researcher to that thing. That's, that's how you do that really, really well. And it is those soft skills, no question. Well, you know, so um, we have this sort of awakening to, to the soft skills that are required for basically collaboration across silos. And, you know, we're, you know, we're both very excited by that. Yet the other trend I want to bring up though, and it's not entirely unrelated, is operationalization. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this whole, like, basically, um, for me, my awakening about the, the need to get people working across silos comes from doing consulting for a huge enterprise in Silicon Valley for a couple of years when I was still doing consulting. And they had all these pockets of really interesting stuff in, in different parts of the company. And, you know, I, I remember... Uh, Walking down the hall uh, way, uh, uh, I'd been working with them for months, and, and I go past a uh, one of the war rooms. I think it's what you call them, and I look through the window, and there's a giant Indian mental model <laughs> of exactly the domain that we were working on. And, and I was like, "What? You didn't tell me you had that." I mean, it, you know, I published the book, but more importantly, as a consultant, I, at the time, I really would have benefited from seeing this. Yeah. If, well, you know, we didn't really, it's kind of a different group that's doing that. And, and at the same time, I was like peppering them for um, access to their um, uh, call center uh, uh, logs and their search logs. And it's like, well, you know, um, we'll try to find those for you. And it took nine months. Wow. Like uh, some, some call center in, in Oklahoma is where, where the, the data was living. And I don't, I'm not even sure if you even get it. So, I mean, like I, I felt like, this was this critical thing that no one was really doing. And, and so I, I started giving this talk about, you know, I, you almost call it insight operations. And I kind of worked backwards to like, well, who's doing this? And what, what really is happening right now is research operations. Yeah. So not cross silo, but within a silo, companies are getting better and there's tools are getting better. Manage things like subject pools and, and nuggetizing uh, your data so you can find patterns more effectively and yada yada that's all well and good uh and then that kind of took me to well how does this tie in the design process and i started learning a little bit about design operation and in fact i had not heard that term 
about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I heard it, uh, I guess I was talking with Dave Maloof, who, who's really doing a lot in this area. And within about three months, two months maybe, we committed to doing the first Design Ops Summit. And um, they really support people doing design ops and research ops. And we did it last November in, in New York. And the next one will be November 7th through 9th again in New York. Uh, designopsummit.com. So, um, you know, so that's like this really exciting area because, you know, we, we've been talking about design thinking for, for years and years and years, and that's all well and good, but like, I think we're ready to take the next step to what I guess, uh, I think it was John Colco came up with this design doing. Yeah. You have all these designers and researchers and talent and, re and data. <laughs> and, you know, if you don't, institutionalize it or operationalize it, build the infrastructure to essentially help those expensive, smart, brilliant people you've hired do the work that you hired them to do, building, you know, through things like, you know, research management tools and, and design systems and pattern libraries, but also things like making sure they're trained well and they are um, supported with principles and guidelines. Uh, you know, that's, I mean, that, that's design ops right there. You need, you need that in order for them to be successful. You need that in order to amplify them and the work they do and uh, eliminate uh, redundancy and inventing the, the wheel over and over again on, on baby stuff, like how to do a date picker. Why does that have to be redesigned by every silo for every project? You know, so I was actually just interviewing Nathan Curtis about that. And I'm not saying you should, he, or he's not saying you should have one for the whole company, but you should at least have a few that you're working from and, and uh, are influencing everyone else. And uh, you maybe you improve them together, but uh, that's a different thing than everyone creating their own. So that's really exciting. And so the conference is doing well. We, we've got, as I said, the second one coming up, and I'm just seeing an explosion. This year, the explo last year, the explosion was around design ops. This year, it seems to be around research ops. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you uh, Google, I'm going to call her out, um, Kate Towsey mm -hmm. uh, does research ops in the UK. Um, she's got a very active Slack community just in the last month or so. Um, we're, we're speaking in April of 2018. Um, you know, I'm sure she uh, would be, I hope she would be happy for more people to join because they're doing some really cool stuff. They are indeed. And, uh, and we are actually part of that Slack channel and I contribute as much as I have to the time for it. It is, it's a very good community that is kind of coming up there. And actually one of the topics that's emerging there as well is that idea of um, this, you know, research technology collaboration, you know, this, this discussing and sharing and, and, um, uh, unified stake in understanding the customers so we can make better decisions uh together between technology and well research. if i could also call out a a community um uh, i run a monthly um conference call via zoom for um people interested in, in design ops and we cover research ops a bit too and we've been getting great turnout about 50 60 people per call it's free uh and if anyone is interested in participating in that they can pop me an email uh, Lou at Rosenfeldmedia.com, and I'd be happy to, uh, to add you to the group. Awesome. Well, you know, on that note, we're we're coming up to close to the end of our chat, and I want to be respectful of your time. So this has been really, really awesome, all of it. But one of the things I started asking folks towards the end of an episode is uh, an interview question I like to ask when I'm bringing new people onto a team or, you know, wrapping up a conversation is if, I had temporary amnesia, and I can only remember one thing from our conversation that you felt was most important for me to remember, or in this case, maybe our listeners to remember. What do you feel like that would be, Lou? Give it time. I guess my, my point being, um, you know, don't, don't be too impatient. There's a lot of change, uh, and um, I guess we get frustrated especially when we're working in large organizations and uh, it feels like things aren't changing and it feels like everywhere else things are getting better. And, and, but, you know, close to home, you're struggling, your department isn't getting funded, your projects are getting uh, uh, turned down. Um, you're not getting listened to by the developers or the, the leadership, whoever the annoying stakeholders are. Um, it just takes time and it will, God, what's it saying? It will get better. 
Um, it really will. Um, and, and, you know, actually, I'm going to put a plug in. This, this is, uh, I guess we're wrapping up. And I did want to say that um, that's actually why we have the Enterprise UX conference. Mm-hmm. And it's really for people who are trying to turn that giant tanker 180 degrees by sticking their foot in the water as a rudder. <laughs> and um, it's happening. And, and the, the conference has really been great. It's really um, helped bring a lot of people together who are struggling and, and actually starting to make some headway in changing culture and, uh, and how large enterprises relate to design and, and user research. We're going to have the next one July, I'm sorry, ooh, ooh, not July, June 13th through 15th in San Francisco. We are fourth one, and uh, it will. You can learn more at enterpriseux.net. Awesome. So, your advice out of everything here: give it time. Uh, is there is there anything else that you would like to share with folks listening to this episode? Well, I mean, I hate to plug things, but I'm excited by some of the things that I get to be involved in. Like um, Evan Hoffman's book, Meeting Design, came out just a, uh, about a month ago. And people really seem to love it. Uh, if you want to apply uh, design thinking to uh, that horrible thing you find yourself in <laughs> in meetings, uh, there is hope. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of people taking what we know as designers and applying it in all kinds of settings and contexts that people haven't really put design in before. So why not design how your meetings work? Kevin is going to show you how to do that in his book, Meeting Design. Um, we have a book available for pre-order right now. It's also very exciting. Uh, it's called Orchestrating Experiences Designed for Complexity, or Designing for Complexity. And um, that's by uh, Chris Risden and uh, Patrick Quattlebaum, who come out of uh, Adaptive Path, uh, among other places. And uh, that book is really a, kind of a, a, a very practical combination of UX, CX, customer experience, and service design, and really helping people solve big systemic problems, which is where a lot of us are headed now. We're really moving from kind of era of micro interactions in a way to macro interactions. So I think people will find that book, which you can order now at a great discount. Um, uh, if you order from rosenbaldmedia.com, uh, I think you'll find that very useful. It comes out uh, May 1. Awesome. And of course, you've got Design Up Summit and Enterprise UX coming up. We'll make sure to have links in the show notes for all of those things, as well as the uh, two new books coming up from both Kevin Hoffman and uh, Chris and Patrick. Lou, thank you so much for joining us on the show. This has been a really great conversation. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks. I hope to, to join you again. Oh, we'd be very happy to have that. All right, everybody. We will see you next time. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a rating on iTunes or wherever it is that you listen to our podcast. And also, you can fill out our podcast survey where you can let us know if someone awesome that we should have on the show and even tell us about the things you would want to hear about, topics that are interesting for you. You can check that out in the show notes or on our website. Thanks for listening to Aurelius Podcast, talking about product strategy and design strategy. We are the first platform of its kind to help you solve the right problems for your customers and your business and build products and services that truly matter. You can check us out at AureliusLab.com. That is www.A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. You can check us out on Twitter at AureliusLab and Instagram AureliusLab. We'll see you next time. Oh, 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 oh,